Spring is coming, and that can only mean one thing, state budget season. Hi, everybody. It's Reporters Roundtable. I'm David Cruz. Our panel of pencil-pushing bean counters includes Matt Arco, politics reporter for NJ Advance Media, Terrence McDonald, editor at New Jersey Monitor, and Daniel Hahn, healthcare reporter for Politico NJ. We will hear from the panel in just a bit, but we begin today with a budget officer's favorite time of year. Governor Murphy is making his annual budget address on Tuesday. Last year's spending plan was a record $52 billion, and there's still lots of federal money left out there to spend. Let's see what the other side thinks. Declan O'Scanlan is the Republican Senate budget officer, and he joins us now. Senator, how you doing, man? Good to see you. I'm well, David. Thanks for having me. Doing very well. No, no complaints. Uh, good. So let's see if you have some complaints when we talk about this budget. What are you expecting? Uh, look, uh, I'm expecting more of the same uh, allocation, random allocation of our huge surpluses uh, and, and the remaining federal money that you just referenced. I am hoping for uh, a much more transparent and competitive process. Last year, we gave out billions of dollars just based on the whims of legislators and the administration. Uh, so you had municipalities with similar needs, or some with greater needs get nothing, uh, than others that got, you know, showered with millions of dollars. That shouldn't be how it's done. We also didn't do things like spend money to avoid taxes, to avoid debt. Uh, Republicans had a comprehensive plan that we hope the governor will pull off the shelf, because uh, it's still relevant, and use that to do a more fair uh, and responsible budget this year. I'll All keep right. my fingers crossed, but I won't hold my breath. <laughs> Let me have some bullet points on the GOP plan. Well, we uh, prescribe things like uh, uh, debt avoidance that really hasn't happened at all. Uh, there's a lot of talk about it from this administration, but we haven't seen it put into action. Uh, we would uh, have allocated the federal money in a fair, open, and transparent process. That, that should be pretty easy to do, but it isn't politically expedient. It doesn't but how is, how, is, how is your uh, distribution of those funds going to differ from the, the governor's distribution of those funds? Well, it won't be just handed out to friends and, and the influential. If you go through the, the distribution of federal money, uh, you will see that 70, 80 percent of it was doled out based purely on politics. There was no competitive process. There was no equal access to every municipality. And look, it wasn't just Republican towns that got screwed, although overwhelmingly they did. There were Democrat towns that did as well. Uh, the, the legislature needs to uh, decide that we're going to make this fair and open. Uh, it was not. I mean, 70, 80 percent of the money was, was done in a, in a back smoke-filled room. Uh, that shouldn't be how it's done. I mean, that sounds, that sounds uh, very sketchy, but like what? what? What are you talking about that was done in the back room that should have seen more of a light of day? There was, sorry about the barking dog in the background. That's, that's all right. the reality we live in now. <laughs> there, there was money spent on soccer fields and cricket fields. And David, I could go through, and Republicans put this out, a list of, of dozens and dozens of items that amounted to billions of dollars that were given to the soccer fields of uh, uh, connected legislators rather than uh, distributed evenly to other towns that had greater needs, more significant needs. We didn't take care of people in uh, homes for, for folks who have catastrophic spinal cord injury, for instance, completely left out of, of the, of the uh, equation while we were funding soccer fields, uh, politically funding soccer fields. So it was, it was an awful process. It shouldn't happen the same way again. And then you have other parts of the Republican plan where we would have avoided uh, school funding cuts to really half the school districts. The governor bragged it was the greatest amount of school funding that had ever been given out, and, and maybe it was, but that still had cuts or, or direct cuts for 200 districts and another uh, set of increases that were under the rate of inflation for another 100. 
So if the governor's going to brag that his school funding cut property taxes, he has to admit that uh, his funding plan increased property taxes in half our school districts. Uh, so Republicans would have undone that. We would have avoided the payroll, massive payroll tax increases that have happened. The governor bragged there were no tax increases. Well, maybe not new ones, but he let scheduled ones happen, amounting to hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that are on the backs of our, uh, our workers uh, and, and the folks that pay them. So there's billions of dollars uh, still kind of floating around there. You're expecting more of same in a year where all of the legislature is up for election. Uh, I do. Well, look, and we will see the temptation to dole out money politically again is very likely to rule the day. Uh, Republicans will fight that. Uh, and we will make a case. Uh, we will make that an issue uh, in this year's elections. Um, also, the, again, we have school districts that, despite the governor's uh, claim of giving out the most school funding ever, that are going to cease to be able to function uh, in my district and in many other districts. It's going to be a problem. And we're doing nothing to head it off. So about this process, we hear every year, oh, we're getting this thing at the last minute and we got to vote on it in 15 minutes. It happened last year. A lot of people were complaining about it. You're expecting that that's going to be the same this year? You guys are going to get handed budgets uh, late in the day on, on, you know, June 30th? Again, I have no reason to believe that anyone has come to their senses and it's going to change that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yes, unfortunately, <laughs> that's the, that's uh, I the short believe answer. that's going to happen. <laughs> Uh, but I hope it won't. And there's no reason for it to. There absolutely is no reason. Uh, it's a really, it's a really crappy way to budget. You know, more than fifty billion dollars. Uh, it, it's really, uh, it's a process that easily could be revamped, uh, be more transparent, be more fair. Uh, and and look, it's bad for you guys too. You, uh, and the press, you have ten minutes to look at these things as well. Yeah. Uh, and, and report to the public, have the public understand what's going on. It really is a shame, and it shouldn't happen this way. You're when for... Republicans have the majority next year, uh, it won't happen that way. All right, I'm going to mark your words on that. Uh, so you're for, you're for a full pension payment, right, in the budget? Uh, I am for full pension. Yeah. Yes, no All question. Right. Yes. Let, let me move, I, let me I, move I praise the governor for, for getting there and making that a priority. That's only fair. All right, let me move on to a couple other non-budget-related things. A lot of towns, although well, this is kind of related to the budget, a lot of towns are leaving the state uh, health care uh, program. How much of a danger does that present to the system? Uh, dramatic. The system could fall apart with this mass exodus that could likely have been avoided had the administration told us as soon as they knew we were going to face these massive increases in, in these rates, and this is for the, uh, uh, the state health benefits plan, um, as soon as we knew that, had they uh, made us aware of that, there were things we could have done, reforms we could have done working with labor. They came to the table with some suggestions. Unfortunately, it was way too late uh, to, to really get a handle on it. Uh, but it's a serious threat. You're going to have some of the best performing uh, uh, towns and, and systems leave the state health benefits plan. And you're going to leave it with the most expensive ones, which means even more, even more drastic increases next year. I really am worried that the system could fall apart because of that. Uh, and I don't. It's, it's a tough, tough solution, unless you're going to come up with a several-year plan to try to lure these towns that are thinking about leaving or actively pursuing leaving, to lure them to to the table, to stick around. Uh, and maybe seed with some federal money. I'm, I'm not sure. It's going to be a massive undertaking, uh, and and I'm I'm very fearful. None of that will happen, and the system will fall apart. We've heard over the last week or two uh, glowing uh, praise for Senator Sam Thompson from the governor and from the uh, Senate uh, president, all welcoming him into the Democratic Party. Um, he says, Sam Thompson says, that he didn't leave the party. The party left him. What, what are your thoughts on how all that unfolded? Uh, I didn't like it. I wasn't happy about it. I, I, you're going to hear nothing but uh, continued praise and respect for me for Sam Thompson. Uh, I adore Sam Thompson. Uh, is it 
time to think about retiring? Probably. And that was a conversation that maybe could have been had differently. Uh, all that having been said, Sam has left the Republican Party. And uh, you know, he made that choice, eyes open. Uh, and again, I still love him, but I'm going to back the Republican nominee. Um, but I wasn't thrilled with how it happened. I said it publicly then. I'll say it now. Yeah. Uh, there was probably a conversation to be had, but it, it didn't work out in a way that made anybody look good. All right. Republican Senate Budget Officer Declan O'Scanlan. Good to see you, man. Thanks for coming on with us. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. All right, panel, Dan, Terrence, Matt, good to see you all. Uh, the entire legislature up for election this year, so that means this budget season is going to just fly by, Daniel, right? It starts with the governor's budget address on Tuesday. Any hints on what we can expect? I'm not sure as to specific line items that we should be expecting, but I will say that I think, as you mentioned, with the entirety of the state legislature up for re-election, all 120 seats, uh, there would be little appetite to really put forward a, a budget that has tax increases. And Governor Murphy has even alluded to the fact that uh, you'll see no new taxes this budget. Um, I think it's important to note that we still have a lot of money in uh, federal COVID relief funds that can still be tapped. And with that, all seats up for re-election, it's hard to imagine that you'll see a, a confrontational tone this budget season. Yeah. Matt, the governor's chief of staff, George Helmy, who's been an important bridge between the legislature and the administration, specifically during budget talks in the past, will not be meeting with lawmakers this year because he's up for a seat on the Port Authority Board, which requires Senate approval, conflict of interest, blah, blah, blah. So does that mean a rougher time cutting deals or is it an indication that lawmakers are going to be calling most of the shots this year since they're up for election? Look, it's a good question. I don't understand, and it, quite frankly, how somebody in his position can totally uh, not be involved in the process. So I'm yeah. a little dubious on that claim that, that that he'll be taking a back seat, especially because, look, so last year we had a brand new Senate president that was uh, uh, navigating a budget for the first time. A um, couple of hiccups with that, but Nick Scutari is going to be a little bit more seasoned this year. But we have George Helmy and Craig Coughlin who have been, um, you know, pretty experienced at this now by this point. So, um, you know, I, 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 I venture to guess that they would sort of be leading the drive here. Um, but, you know, like last year, we, we came pretty close to a, budget, uh, a, a government shutdown just by the, the fact that, um, you know, we had somebody a little bit new um, or, or new um, uh, steering the budget in the Senate caucus. Um, after, you know, all those years of, of Steve Sweeney doing it, very experienced. So um, I, I'm at this point not thinking that it's going to go down to the 11th hour. Yeah. Terrence, last minute bills, 100 page amendments, new language dropped on lawmakers at five o'clock on June 30th. You never know. I'm what's... sorry, David, I couldn't I couldn't get that question. I, I was saying that all of these last minute amendments um, and language that gets changed at up to five o'clock on June thirtieth. You never know what's in this Not budget. Getting it, sorry. All right, we're... Can you hear me now, Terry? Not, not hearing you. Sorry. All right, we're going to move on. Yep, see there if you we go. Can't get... Oh, we can hear you now. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Yes. Yeah, so you go. I, I was saying we get all these last-minute amendments and uh, language that mm -hmm. gets changed. Last-minute amendments. What's the likelihood of that ever changing? Uh, there's no likelihood that it ever will change. <laughs> That's just how they do things here. Yeah. Despite all the complaining last year, there was lots of hand wringing about this and proposed legislation to change it. Not happening. No, well, they, I mean, I mean, we don't like it, and the public doesn't like it, and the opposition doesn't like it, but that's the way that the people who are writing the budget like it. Yeah. Right. Makes sense for them. All right, Matt. Uh, the can I just say? Can I say going back to, with, with all respect to the, the senator, um, sure. I, I do appreciate what he has to say about you know, the, the the lopsidedness in money going to uh, certain lawmakers in their districts. Yeah. But I am old enough to remember when Chris Christie gave a lot of money. Republican Chris Christie gave a lot of money to Democrat uh, Joe D for his zoo. So you know this has been going on for quite some time. That's not to say that it's it's 
probably not the best way that government should function. Um, but I, I'd be very interested to see a little bit more consistency and criticism, uh, depending on, you know, who, who's behind the governor's desk. But, you know, he did make that reference to when, when they take the chamber uh, after these next election, that it will be different. So if that does happen, I look forward to seeing how that works. Everybody's shocked, shocked that there's gambling at the casino. Uh, <laughs> let me stick with you here, Matt. The budget, it becomes the document on which all of these folks are going to run in 2023. But just who's going to be running is still pretty fluid. This week, we saw Assemblyman Caputo retire to a seat on the Horizon Board. How many seats do they have over there? Um, anyway, do we know who's going to retire next? I mean, the list so far is, is I, I don't know who's going to be retiring next. So, so the short answer is no. But the list has been growing over the past few months. Um, but I, I, you know, I wouldn't look at that. I mean, you know, as as you know, on the federal level, when a bunch of folks tend to retire, it's probably because the winds are changing, the political winds are changing, yeah. that it's just, you know, they're probably going to lose their seats. I don't think that that's exactly what's going on in Jersey, um, with the exception of a couple of seats, just because redistricting and things like that. But um, but no, I, the, the short answer is no. I don't know next week. But at the rate that we've been going, yeah, maybe somebody next week is going to announce that they, they won't be uh, running. But uh, filing is coming up. Uh, what are we, uh, a month or less away? So uh, we should know much sooner than later. All right, your homework assignment is to develop the rules for a drinking game that we can make out of who's running and who's not running. Uh, <laughs> Daniel, is this your first legislative election covering in Jersey? And, and what are you expecting is going to be driving the narrative? Well, I was here for the 2021 gubernatorial election where all 120 seats were up. Yeah. Um, just speaking to retirement, I think that one of the big pictures here is that we're seeing a lot of turnover in the legislature, more so than usual. At least 15 members have no plans on coming back. Uh, and we still have, as Matt mentioned, we have uh, filing deadlines, we have primaries and a general election that could change up the composition. Uh, as to what is going to be driving this, uh, uh, the, the, the legislative elections for, for, for the cycle, um, I still think that there's a lot of focus on affordability. Um, if you're in uh, the second legislative district, perhaps focus on whales washing up on the uh, Jersey shore. Um, but I, I think that Republicans are definitely more optimistic than they have in the past two decades that they could take over a control of a chamber or at least reach 50-50. Yeah, old Scanlon was sounding confident about that. Uh, unrelated, I think, uh, sentencing this week in the murder for hire case involving uh, Sean Cattle, the former political consultant and bag man. Terrence, uh, one of the hitmen was sentenced this week, right? What's the latest on that? Yes, Bomani Africa. He was one of the men who admitted killing um, uh, Michael Gagliari in Jersey City in 2014. He agreed to take, um, I think it was $15,000 cash from Sean mm -hmm. Cattle, this political operative whose guilty plea sort of started this whole uh, media frenzy off. And um, he was he's the first to be sentenced and uh, judge put him away for 20 years. I think that the, uh, I think the judge said he was leaning toward a little more, but um, shaved a few years off because uh, uh, the guy had been cooperating with federal prosecutors. Yeah. Matt, uh, we may yet have to talk about Murphy for president, but right now it's Chris Christie's turn to say if he is or if he ain't running. Uh, we did a piece on this this week for President's Day. Uh, and we heard from some Christie insiders, including Senator John Bramnick, who had this assessment of Christie for president. I still just can't figure out knowing pro-Trumpers and anti-Trumpers. I just don't I just don't see how either side loves you. And, you know, in politics, it's momentum and you need a base. I just don't know where his base is. I mean, I'm part of his base. Right. But I think, uh, you know. I just appreciate his ability on policies. I just don't see how nationally he can get that kind of backing. I think from a lot of us, Matt, is that's the assessment we would have. But coming from someone really close to Christie, surprised at that assessment? Uh, well, still candidly, this is the first time that I'm seeing that. So I've been hearing from close Christie confidants for months. Um, give the same assessment. Um, the fact that that John Bramnick, who is is very close to Chris Christie, 
um, is saying that openly, um, you know, confirms what Christie's troubles will be if he launches a campaign. And I believe the last time that he was on record saying that he would make an announcement, you know, he, he said that he would make it in like the maybe by April. Um, and, and that's coming up pretty quickly. Yeah. And to see where he is in the early polling, which is not well. Um, Literally zero percent. Uh, yeah, I think what, what John Bramnick said. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I think John articulated it very well. And that and that's, again, coming from, you know, months ago when I would speak with Christy Confidant, they privately shared those concerns. Um, and now that, that, that somebody like John is saying that openly, I think it's pretty telling. Um, and then, of course, if you if you look at the polling as well, um, you know, it, 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 it says a lot. But Chris Christie, uh, very ambitious guy. Uh, I don't expect him, even if he doesn't launch a presidential bid, to just uh, stay at ABC News as a, a news analysis. Um, he's got to be, I'm sure, working on something and wants to continue to be in the picture of the Republican Party. Uh, who knows? Maybe if a friend gets elected president, um, you know, attorney general. That wouldn't be a, a bad consolation prize for him. We'll see. Speaking of men with higher aspirations, uh, Steve Fulop, Terrence Aaron Morrill of the Jersey City Times writing about a junket with the mayor, council members, and other city officials to Paris to meet with Pompidou Museum officials who are set to open a satellite in Jersey City. Privately funded trip. This is your old beat. Uh, thoughts on the American mayor in Paris? Yeah, I don't yeah, I don't know what to say about this. I <laughs> I mean, it sounds like uh, a big fancy museum would be really great for that part of Jersey City maybe, and maybe that'd be a big feather in his cap, but um I don't know. If I guess if like I'm not a political consultant, but I probably would have nixed a, a a privately funded junket to Paris uh, uh that uh that Phillips uh political opponents could use against him when he runs for some other office, who knows in the future. Too easy. But Daniel, again, that's not my call. Yeah. Daniel, we heard O'Scanlan sounding alarm about towns dumping out of the state's health care system. Uh, has the trickle turned into a stream now? And is it really a threat to the system? It's certainly a concern that I've been hearing in any health insurance program. Whenever you have more people leaving, uh, especially healthier towns, municipalities that have options, you are stuck with a smaller population, perhaps a sicker population, and that could cause rates to increase. And then the cycle, uh, it goes into a death spiral repeating itself. What I'm curious to see is what are the rates going to be for this year? We now know that the Murphy administration got mid-year reports around this time last year forecasting increases in healthcare utilization, which ultimately drives to rates. What is the utilization like for uh, the rate renewal process going into this year? Also, there are, associate, uh, there are local government groups that have been mulling the creation of their own joint health insurance program. What does that look like, and how does that siphon more towns off of the current state health benefits program run by the state? Yep. All right, time for our Only in Jersey segment, headlines and notes that are quintessentially Jersey. Dan, you want to start us off? So my Only in Jersey moment is a story that we just published this morning that the Murphy administration is requesting the legislature approve $12 million to build the New Jersey Hall of Fame in the American Dream Mall. I will say it does not get more New Jersey than Governor Phil Murphy, American Dream, and the New Jersey Hall of Fame. Yes. Uh, Matt, you got something for us? Yeah. Look, Daniel, uh, I, I think, was the first to spot something in, uh, in the name, uh, legislation in the name of transparency, the Election Law Enforcement Commission, yeah. which I thought was pretty interesting that they want to make the executive director a gubernatorial appointee. Currently, uh, the ED is uh, uh, elected by the commissioners or, or, or tapped by the commissioners. Um, and in the name of transparency, that is the exact opposite, because as you we all know, uh, governors do run uh, uh, for office, so they're 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 uh, bound by elect rules. So that that was an interesting one, and and kudos to Daniel for for spotting it. Yes, Terrence, you got one for us. Yes, uh, this one comes from reporting from Katie Sapko at the Record, uh, the New Jersey Sports and Exposition, Exposition Authority, the state agency that oversees the Meadowlands, decided to pick a new boss. And the last time they picked a new boss, they went with the chair of the Hudson County Democrats. And this year they went with the chair of the Bergen County Democrats. So 
Just a very <laughs> only in Jersey moment. As long as you are the chair of some Democratic Party in the state, you will get a great six-figure job. Nice golden parachutes for all. Uh, mine comes from Trenton, where Democrats have laid out the red carpet for Sam Thompson. The party switching uh, senator quit the GOP, which he says dumped him because he was too old. I'm going to admit that I'm mostly bringing this up to show this priceless B-roll of Senator Sam Thompson busting move after move, including a classic pause at the 2016 GOP convention. The Democratic <laughs> governor and the Democratic Senate president say it's a big tent party. But only in blue jersey can Democrats warmly welcome a pro-Trump, anti-choice right-winger like Sam Thompson as if he's not against everything they stand for. Now that is some fancy footwork. And that's Roundtable for this week. Terrence, Matthew, Dan, good to see you all. Thanks also to Declan O'Scanlan for joining us. You can follow the show on Twitter at RoundtableNJ and find all kind of fresh content every day when you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hey, be sure to join us Tuesday at 2 p.m. when NJ Spotlight News brings you coverage of Governor Phil Murphy's annual budget address. Brianna Venosi is at the desk. I'll be at the State House, and the team will be providing context and analysis. That's Tuesday, 2 p.m. on NJPBS and all of our streaming platforms. I'm David Cruz from the entire crew here at Gateway Center, Newark. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Major funding for Reporters Roundtable with David Cruz is provided by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Business Magazine, the magazine of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, reporting to executive and legislative leaders in all 21 counties of the Garden State since 1954. And by Politico's New Jersey Playbook, a topical newsletter on Garden State politics, online at politico.com.